Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about the 12 etymological days of Christmas. But as always, before we get to that, some follow-up. From not our last episode, which was on Turkey and Thanksgiving, but on the episode that we put out before that, which we didn't have time to follow up on follow-up from in our Turkey episode. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of good comments that I just wanted to share. Uh, first of all, on our website, MVR commented that, of course, the connection between Douglas Adams and Neil Gaiman, which we mused about but didn't actually look up while we were talking, was not only that they had both written for Doctor Who, but that Gaiman wrote a sort of biography called Don't Panic of Douglas Adams. It's a sort of a guide to the Hitchhiker's Guide, hmm. interestingly. And it was very early in his writing career. So obviously that's a very close connection. And it shows that there was a strong connection between them. Right. And also, when I looked it up, uh, that book came out in 88. So since he wrote American Gods in 2001, all of that stuff about belief forming gods was right. well in his background. Not that it was unique to Adams, but still, it was definitely there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mention at the time the other connection in terms of books to Neil Gaiman and American Gods and the other of the trifecta of people who wrote about gods and belief and this idea that it, divinities are formed through belief systems is Terry Pratchett, in particular in his book, Small Gods, which was 1992, where he explores that idea in depth. And of course, Terry Pratchett was a very close friend, an important friend of Neil Gaiman's. They co-wrote a book together and they were old friends. So in those three, those ideas were definitely being kicked around. Right. So I just wanted to follow up on that. And then second, there was a post on Facebook, a comment on Facebook from our friend Jeff, who pointed out that we had kind of talked a little bit about how including Gordon Way's computer program yeah. was interesting, but not particularly relevant to the plot. And Jeff pointed out that, in fact, it is in that it is at least thematically yeah. relevant. I'm just going to quote what he said because he says it well. It lets Adams give a bunch of exposition that expands thematically on something that's happening in the background fairly early in the book without actually having to tell you what's happening until much later, which is certainly mm -hmm. important to the structure of Dirk Gently. Namely, it lets him develop and familiarize the reader with this theme of having a conclusion you want someone to reach and then retroactively constructing a plausible sounding sequence of arguments that leads to it which is exactly what the ghost is doing as it, for example, convinces Richard that it's perfectly logical for him to climb up the side of a building and break into Susan's apartment because he regrets mm -hmm. leaving the message. And that's how the te ghost tests out its subjects to find one who will do the thing it actually wants. So there's a thematic reason, if not a plot reason, for including it. And Jeff's quite right, and we should have thought of that, and we weren't giving Adams enough credit, clearly. <laughs> right. And then he also points out that the murder mystery involves Gordon, the maker of the software, being killed by the monk, the predetermined belief machine, mm -hmm. which is only on Earth because Reg was off covering up his retroactively justified fiddling with the past, the magic trick, on behalf of the ghost. It's like a little object lesson in the dangers of putting belief first and reasons second. Yes. <laughs> and that is a good point to make, and I think it's absolutely thematically important to the books and probably one we should all be reminding ourselves of, <laughs> coming up with good reasons for things you want to believe. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong way to do it. Okay, so that was just that little bit of follow-up. Now, you had some more you wanted to say about something you mentioned last time. Yeah, just to repeat what I said last time about this n exciting new project from James Burke, mm -hmm. uh, the James Burke Connections app, which will allow you to basically search through connections found on Wikipedia. So it's a sort of Wikipedia viewer, but mm -hmm. it, one that works connectively, tracing the connections and even finding the connections for you. So if you want to see how two seemingly unrelated things can be connected. Right. So if you want to justify a connection retroactively, retroactively. <laughs> you exactly. can do so. You can do hmm. so. Wait a minute. Um, so there's a, a Kickstarter to fund this project. So I strongly urge you to consider kicking a little money um, and becoming a backer on Kickstarter. If you go to knowledgediscoveries.com, you can find more information there and a link to the Kickstarter page. 
Uh, and if you want to hear a little bit more about the app itself and some of the thinking behind it, I strongly recommend a really excellent interview on the podcast, You Are Not So Smart, which is one of my favorite podcasts in any case. So it's a good one to recommend if you haven't listened to it. But he interviews James Burke on the podcast. David McCraney is the, is the host of You Are Not So Smart, and he interviews James Burke. And they talk about the app and all kinds of other interesting things about thinking about connections and interdisciplinary and so forth. Mm -hmm. So very appropriate for, for our listeners, I would think. Mm -hmm. And what, do you know which episode that is? That is episode number 89. Okay, we'll certainly have links to that. Yes. In our show notes. All right. And speaking of podcasts, we enjoy a recent podcast that we've both been enjoying mm -hmm. or that we've both recently found. I think it's also fairly new. Yeah. That is very much up our alley is Idiom Savant. Where does that expression come from up our alley? <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to ask them. And what they do is they're short 10, 15 minute podcasts about the origins of common words, uh, common phrases and idioms. Yes. And they have a number of um, games they play sometimes to try to... They present a number of possible etymologies and the other, the other host has to guess... Which one is correct. Which is the correct one. <laughs> They've also got a couple of other versions of games. But mm -hmm. yeah, they're, and they're fun. They're entertaining and they're also illuminating. Yes. So I recommend you check that out. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. All right. I think that's all the follow-up. Time to move on to cocktails. <laughs> As I mentioned at the beginning, what we're talking about today is the 12 etymological days of Christmas, in particular referencing the video from last year. Yes which was based around the song, The Twelve Days well, of Christmas. The Twelve Days of Christmas. The first gift of which is the partridge in a pear tree. So I looked, and it turns out there are multiple cocktails named a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> this has been thought of independently by people several times. So we're each drinking a different one, a different version, both slightly adapted because that's how we roll. Mine was supposed to have champagne in it. But I don't have champagne. And I did, wasn't about to buy a bottle of even cheap champagne just for this. So instead of adding champagne at the end, I just upped the amount of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed completely vodka reasonable. Champagne. Nearly the same thing. So it's pear vodka, though we're actually using three olives, pear and apple vodka, because that was all I could find. But it's quite pear-y. It's very pear-y. I don't think there's very much apple. Though, you know what? It's called apples and pears vodka, not apple and pear vodka. And it is made with English wheat. And I've got to think that it's a nod to the rhyming slang, apples and oh. pears, because that's all I can think of when I think of apples and pears. I think it just means stairs. Okay. In, in, in Cockney, Cockney rhyming, rhyming, rhyming slang. slang. So anyway, so this cocktail has the apple and pears vodka and lemon juice and rosemary syrup, which I made earlier today, just a simple syrup with rosemary infused in it. And it is very nice. It's quite sweet because the vodka is sweet and then the sugar syrup. Mm. But the rosemary comes through nicely. Yeah, I like the rosemary syrup. And with the pear, that's a really good combination. All right, and yours? Mine? I, I think I'll need you to describe it, actually. Oh, yeah, you... I, I did make it for you. Uh, again, it's slightly altered, but not as altered. It has pear nectar, pear juice, uh, but it called for four ounces, and I only put two ounces in. So it's not as tall a drink as it right. was made to be. And then gin, and mm -hmm. I upped the amount of gin because I knew you'd be sad if it was only one <laughs> ounce. And then again, lemon juice, and mm -hmm. that this is actually the one for which the rosemary simple syrup was, was made. Made for okay. Yeah, it was made for that one, and so I had and so the rosemary simple syrup. Mmm. Oh, I like this. Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah. Do you want to try mine? Sure. I want to try yours. And I made fancy garnishes. You have to go look at the picture on the website because I made pear fans with rosemary sticks in them, and kind of look like birds a little bit, maybe a bird tail or something. I don't know. They look pretty cool. They're both good. Mm, yeah. It's the rosemary syrup, I think, mm. really gives it depth so that it's not just sweet or acidic. It's got that almost savoriness to it. Mm -hmm. mm. Very nice. All right. So now we're going to just drink our cocktails and we'll <laughs> uh, talk to you later. <laughs> All right. So what are we talking about today, Mark? Well, it's last year's Christmas video. And since the previous year I had done Yule, I you know, had to think of something different to do. And it occurred to me that I wanted something with a lot of etymologies. And I just thought of the song, 12 Days of Christmas. There are 12 items. I could just do the etymologies of each item and talk right. a bit about the song itself and about Christmas carols and so forth and so on. And it hung together in a nice little package, as it mm -hmm. were. And it gave you its structure right off the top. So that was helpful. Yeah. 
All right. So is there anything else you want to say to introduce it or should we just listen to it straight and then... I think we should just jump into it. And okay. Then... And then we can talk about it afterwards, whatever little bits there are to add to it. And then some... And I think you want to say some stuff about the song itself and, and the tradition it comes out of. Yes. All right. So let's listen. The song's title refers to the 12 days running from Christmas Day until January 5th, the Eve of Epiphany. It includes a number of other religious and secular dates that are celebrated as part of the Christmas season, such as the Feast of St. Stephen on the 26th, you know, when good King Wenceslas looked out, and New Year's. In the Middle Ages, the time leading up to Christmas, from Advent to Christmas Eve, was traditionally a time of restraint and fasting, while the Twelve Days of Christmas were a time of merriment, games, and feasting, with the Lord of the Manor responsible for entertaining and providing for those in his care. The song itself first appeared in print just as text without music in 1780, with the now familiar melody, an adaptation of a folk tune, first published by composer Frederick Austin in 1909. It seems to have originally been a cumulative song, or forfeit game, in which each participant would have to run through the growing list of gifts without stumbling, then add one more. Now, of course, we think of it as a Christmas carol. The word carol comes to English from Old French, either from the same Greek source which gives us choir, or from a Latin root which means little crown. Originally, the word was used to refer not to a song, but a type of ring dance, and it only gained the specific association of a Christmas song in the early 16th century. Though there have been many theories about the significance of the gifts in the Twelve Days of Christmas, it's probably just a fun game. And so, in that light-hearted spirit, we'll have a look at the etymology of those twelve items and see what they might tell us about the Christmas season. Partridge has only one cognate in English. Fart. Partridge comes through Latin and Greek perdix from a Proto-Indo-European root which meant to fart loudly, apparently because of the sound the bird's wings make. So basically, partridge means fart bird. I say the root means to fart loudly because Proto-Indo-European had another similar root which means to fart softly, both words being basically imitative of the sound of the bodily function they describe. The fart softly root lingers in a few more English words such as fizzle, feisty, originally used to refer to smelly dogs, which were apparently also aggressive, and petard, now only used in the phrase Shakespeare famously coined in Hamlet, hoist with his own petard. A petard is a small bomb used for blowing up gates and walls, so the idiom means literally lifted up by his own fart bomb. In Greek myth, Perdix is also the name of the nephew of Daedalus, who is so jealous of Perdix's ingenuity at inventing that he pushed his nephew off a tower. But Athena, the goddess of cleverness, transformed him into a partridge, a bird which avoids lofty heights and always builds its nest on the ground which makes it a bit odd that the partridge would be in a pear tree, but it's been suggested that the line may have become confused from an original that had both the English word and the French name for the bird perdrie, not a pear tree. Similarly, the turtle of turtle dove doesn't come from the name of the reptile, but from a Latin root which is also imitative of the sound that bird makes. The name for the reptile is related to tortoise, which comes either from a Latin root meaning twisted, because of the shape of its feet, or from Greek tartarus, because of the belief that they came from the underworld. This word turned into turtle because it sounded similar to the already existing word referring to the bird. As for the word dove, it's either related to dive, because of the flight of the bird, or it comes from a root meaning to rise in a cloud, like smoke, referring to the bird's smoky plumage. The Bible mentions that two turtle doves were offered in sacrifice at the circumcision of Jesus, which took place one week after his birth, and has been celebrated in the Christian calendar as the Feast of the Circumcision of Christ on January 1st, so as part of the Twelve Days of Christmas. Throughout the Middle Ages, trade in sacred relics such as the bones of a saint was big business, and could bring in donations from wealthy pilgrims to any church that had one. At one point, there were in existence as many as 18 different purportedly authentic foreskins of Jesus, known as the Holy Prepice, but over the years, most of them went missing, the last one as recently as 1983. That one was rumoured to have been stolen by the Roman Catholic Church, which has more recently downplayed the Feast of the Circumcision, probably because the whole thing is kind of embarrassing. Moving on to the next bird, the word hen comes from a root which means to sing, which might seem a bit odd until one realises that the word originally meant the rooster, the singer of the dawn, but somewhere along the line the word underwent a sex change and now refers to a female chicken or other female birds. As for why they're French hens, 
The adjective, which could sometimes mean foreign or rare, as in French nuts for walnuts, a common Christmas treat, comes from the name of a Germanic tribe, the Franks, which moved into Gaul or modern day France. The Franks, who took their name from a type of javelin that was their preferred weapon, or it might have been the other way around, were thus conquerors, and so the word Frank came to mean superior or free, in contrast to those they conquered who weren't free. So when you speak frankly, you're speaking freely or openly, or etymologically I suppose, in French. So the French hens might simply be a superior or rare breed, and this sense also lies behind another famous Christmas connection, the frankincense which was given to the baby Jesus by one of the three magi, again literally superior incense, or the good stuff. Well it was a present for the Son of God. Though etymologically those French hens are singing, of all the birds mentioned in the song, the four calling birds at first glance seem to be the only ones expressly said to be singing. Except they're not. The calling is another misheard and reinterpreted lyric, and the line was originally collie birds, or literally coley or coal coloured birds. In other words, blackbirds. Funnily enough, the word coal originally meant a glowing ember, not the dark coloured mineralized fossil of carbon or the charcoal produced by superheating wood to remove the water, but it's the later dark coloured association that lies behind collie birds, and probably also the dog breed known as collie. The word bird, by the way, was originally brid, referring specifically to young birds, with fowl being the more general term for birds, and might therefore be related to the word brood. As for coal, there are of course several Christmas tide associations, such as the lump of coal you receive in your stocking if you've been bad, and the piece of coal you're supposed to carry as you cross the threshold for the first time in the new year as part of the first footing tradition of Scotland and Northern England. While the five gold rings seem to be the first to break our run of birds, they may in fact be birds after all, either as another mishearing of gold sphinx, another word for goldfinches, or as a reference to the rings around the necks of pheasants. Or it might be from gulderer or guldercock, an old Scottish term for turkey, commonly served for Christmas dinner, referring to the gobbling sound it makes. The word gold itself comes from a root which means to shine, and also gives us words such as gleam, glow, and yellow. Ring goes back to a root which means turn or bend, and is thus related to such tangentially Christmassy words as cross and crown, which may lie behind the word carol you remember. Before the turkey overtook it as the preferred Christmas dinner, the goose was the roast bird of choice for feasts. The word goose goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root with a similar meaning. The common slang term to goose, meaning to poke or pinch someone's butt, first recorded in the late 19th century, supposedly comes from the resemblance of an upturned thumb to a goose's neck. To lie and its causative form to lay come from a Proto-Indo-European root which has a number of other derivatives in English, including ledger, from the idea it's a large book that lies permanently in one place. Originally the word was used to refer to large religious books, such as Bibles and breviaries, but later came to refer to books of financial accounts, especially after the invention of double-entry bookkeeping in the 15th century. Speaking of which, PNC Wealth Management calculates a Christmas price index, based on the current cost of all the items in the 12 days of Christmas, as a humorous way of tracking inflation. As of 2015 it would cost $155,407.18 to buy all the gifts mentioned in the song, assuming the entire number is bought again every time they're mentioned. That goose root occasionally refers to other waterfowl, such as a swan in the old Irish cognate. However, the English word swan, funnily enough, comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to sound, which also gives us such words as sound and sonic. This is odd because swans, like hens, aren't particularly known for their singing. In fact, historically it was thought that swans were mute, and there was a legend that they sang a beautiful though mournful song only just before dying, hence the idiom swan song. Though this belief goes back to the ancient world, the expression is only found in English from the 19th century. The word swim goes back to a Proto-Germanic root with roughly the same meaning, that also coincidentally gives us the otherwise unrelated word sound, in the sense of a body of water such as an inlet or narrow channel between the mainland and an island. So etymologically the swans of swimming are the sounding birds in the sound. Leaving that type of bird behind, maid, a shortening of maiden, itself a diminutive, had the earlier sense of a virgin or a young unmarried girl, like Jesus' mother Mary but it goes back to a root which meant a young person of either sex. Because of the sorts of work a young unmarried girl would be expected to do, the word took on its modern associations. 
One such job might be in the production of dairy foods, so a dairymaid or milkmaid, and it's that type of work which gives milk its name too, because milk comes from a root which means to wipe or stroke, also giving us such words as emulsion and promulgate. So it refers to the action of collecting milk by stroking the teat of the cow or other milk producing animal, not to the milk itself nor its biological production. Another association of the milkmaid is her beautiful skin, as in the old fashioned idiom smooth as a milkmaid's skin. The reason she has such smooth skin is that milkmaids wouldn't get the disfiguring and often deadly disease of smallpox because they were exposed to the similar but more benign cowpox, building up a natural immunity. And that's where vaccination, both the thing and the word for it, came from when Edward Jenner had the bright idea of developing a smallpox vaccine from the cowpox virus, and it got its name from the Latinate root meaning cow. Now all the dairy work really shouldn't have been done by the maids, but by the ladies, at least etymologically speaking. The word dairy comes from the same root as the D part of lady, originally meaning to form or build, and only later restricted to milk related work, but this root also gives us the word dough, which is a clue to the meaning of the first part of lady, that is, the word loaf. So originally, ladies were loaf makers. I guess you could say they've gone up in the world, which may be why they have all that time for dancing, a word that either comes from a root that means to tremble, or one that means to pull or stretch, suggesting dancing at a line or file. That stretch root also gives us the words thin and tone from the idea of a taut string on a musical instrument, and either way these dancing ladies remind us of the Christmas carol which involved both singing and dancing. And it's dancing that's probably implied by the leaping of those lords. The word lord, of course, is similarly formed to lady, meaning literally loaf guardian, and this reminds us of the necessity of generosity of the lord of the manor in entertaining and feeding those less fortunate. The word leap comes from a Germanic root with roughly the same meaning, and funnily enough it also gives us the other word loaf, as in to spend time idly. So those lords are really loafing loaf guards, the idle class indeed. Of course, with all this dancing we have to have music, and so there's the piper's piping, another imitative root that is often used of the chirping of birds, and then by extension of the tubular musical instrument, and then of any tube, musical or not. But from the chirping bird sense, through Latin and French, we also get the word pigeon, another name for the dove or turtle dove from before. And at last we come to those drummers drumming. Though it's a little unclear exactly what the root is and what it means, drum seems to come from the same root as trumpet and trombone. Though the musical instruments don't on the face of it seem that similar, it appears this root referred generally to a noisy instrument, which might be specified by a compound word like drum slade, the slade part meaning to hit, so a noisy instrument you hit. This was eventually shortened simply to drum. That slade part, by the way, is related to slay and slaughter, which originally had the sense of hitting and eventually came to mean to kill by hitting, or simply to kill. And at Christmas might remind us of the biblical story of the slaughter of the innocents, in which King Herod attempted to avoid the prophecy of a coming messiah by having all the male children that might be Jesus put to death, an event commemorated on December 28 and recounted in another seasonal song, the Coventry Carol. Oh, and as for the word trumpet, or its shortening trump, it quickly developed a slang sense meaning to make a sound like a trumpet, or in other words, to fart, noisily. And that brings us back to the first gift of that fart bird, the partridge. So I mentioned that there were some other explanations about what the meaning of the items in the song. Right. What overall, the, overall. The, what the purpose yeah. of the list was. And I was sort of referring to this theory that you, you may see circulated on the internet uh, this time of year, that the items in the song actually represent the Catholic catechism. So mm -hmm. the partridge in a pear tree is Jesus on the cross, mm -hmm. and the four calling birds represents the four evangelists, and so forth. Anyways, each of the things sort of represents... Something in the life of Christ. Something in the life of Christ, yeah. That theory has been debunked, pretty much. It's not true, but I come across a more recent, or more recently have come across another theory that I quite like, mm -hmm. uh, in that since the first string of them, the first seven things, mm -hmm. are all birds, mm -hmm. it actually may represent a sort of recipe a kind of... Oh. Uh, <laughs> what you'd put on the feasting table or something? Well, a sort of medieval or early modern version of a turducken. Oh my goodness. 
<laughs> birds stuffed into each other because they're also vaguely in size Con order. In size order, right. Well, this comes from a very excellent book by Mark Forsyth called A Christmas Cornucopia. It just came out this year. Right. And he points out that there's, quote, uh, there's a Christmas recipe in 1747 for a large turkey stuffed with a whole goose, stuffed with a chicken, stuffed with a pigeon, stuffed with a partridge, huh. like a Russian doll made of meat. That really is a, you know, medieval or, well, I guess, 18th century version yeah. of a, uh, a turducken. <laughs> and if you replace the turkey with a swan. Yes. Which would be equally large. Equally And, large. and certainly mm -hmm. was the feasting bird. Yeah. Before there were turkeys. It was the sort of the bird of royalty. Right. That you would have on the table. Oh, that's interesting. So it could, could well be a, a recipe. <laughs> I quite like that idea. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, the 12 days of Christmas are a time for feasting mm -hmm. uh, after Advent. So it all it all kind of makes sense. Yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah. So touching on a, a few of the other a few of the other mm -hmm. etymologies, feisty. <laughs> yes. From the other word for fart, the, <laughs> the silent farting. We talked about this, you and I, last year about mm -hmm. it being a potentially gendered term mm -hmm. uh, that you talk about old ladies being feisty. Yeah, or women or, or in women general. in general being mm -hmm. feisty. Etym Online, the online etymology dictionary lists a sort of early passage quotation from this. Mm -hmm. In an 1811 slang dictionary, there is the definition, quote, a small windy escape backwards, more obvious to the nose than ears, frequently by old ladies charged on their lap dogs. Right. Combining the uh, earlier sense of it. Yes. And though it, it, it occurred to me that I suppose the, the male equivalent to feisty in that context of an old woman mm -hmm. would be an old fart. <laughs> I suppose if it's etymologically anyway. Because yes. you'd only ever use that term, an old fart of a man, wouldn't you? Usually, yeah. I, I mean, I know women who use it of themselves, but mm. I mean, people like my grandmother. But it's, <laughs> it's all with a humorous intent. Right. I mean, I agree. I think it's, it's generally a, a male term. Just to follow up on that, just looking it up on the Engram viewer, if you look at feisty woman and feisty man, neither are used very often until 1970. Ah. But feisty woman takes off about 1980, and it's it's all feisty women and hardly any feisty men. This is a feminism backlash, presumably? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, because when we were talking about the gendered nature mm -hmm. of it, I was saying that women are, you use the term feisty of a woman because what's sort of being implied is that a woman is no, more normally passive. That right. you have to mark that a woman is being not passive, not passive and yeah. sort of not exactly aggressive, but there's a, an, uh, the idea of it being small dogs or whatever is an uppityness or uh, uppityness, or maybe just that you're fighting back and sort of unwilling to take stuff from other people. Right. But you'd say that about a woman because it'd be unusual. Whereas a man who's sort of unwilling to take guff from other people or isn't passive is the unmarked category right. for maleness, or at least has been. So you wouldn't say a man is feisty. And there's a slightly, it can be used in a somewhat patronizing way too, as in a, a way of dismissing a woman. Oh, she's right. Oh, she's feisty, isn't she? And it's sort of patting around the head and saying, well, yes, you do yap nicely. Yes, we all noticed how much you're telling us about things, but really it doesn't matter because none right. of your words really matter, as opposed to, you know, a, an assertive man or something like that. Right. So I think that in that sense, that gendered nature, it would be makes total sense that it would be mm. fairly recent and that it would come about as a reaction to women who were more uppity. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, I mean, that's possibly not terribly impressive data to back it up, <laughs> but I think there is something there. Well, moving around to the other end, can I talk more about circumcision? <laughs> Not quite the other end. <laughs> the other <laughs> side. side. The other side. <laughs> oh, please, my dear, talk more about circumcision. <laughs> Everyone wants to hear it, I'm sure. Well, I've got a sort of medieval reference, obviously, to this. Mm -hmm. uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which mm -hmm. takes place at New Year's, which is when the festival of the circumcision is. Mm -hmm. And there is this idea that, I mean, in that poem, as now, this time of year is associated with a sort of second chance, like make, trying to do better in the new year. Right. So, you know, Gawain gets his second chance at the end of the poem when his life is spared. Mm -hmm. He just gets a little, a little tiny little cut on the neck, a little bit of blood. Instead of having his head cut off. Instead of having his head cut, cut with, off. Yeah. yeah. And so that little cut, sort of standing in for a large cut, mm. is 
is the symbolism of exactly the symbolism of the uh, circumcision, which is seen as the first time Jesus sheds blood for sheds humanity, blood for humanity yeah. and it prefigures the crucifixion. Right. Right. So it is all quite uh, interestingly appropriate and relevant and mm. uh, you know full of symbolic meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, as for the, the walnut being referred to as the French nut, yes. I, I should perhaps also mention that, of course, walnut itself means literally foreign nut or Welsh nut, to, right. etymologically speaking. The, the, that wall part is the same word as Welsh. It means it comes from somewhere else. Yeah. And it comes from the Anglo-Saxon word, well, that means foreigner. And so this is the, the terrible irony of it is that the Welsh are known to the English as foreigners, foreigners mm -hmm. in their own country, the English being invaders, mm -hmm. the Anglo-Saxons being invaders. Of course, the Welsh don't call themselves Welsh. Yes. They call themselves Cumini, or they call their language Cumini. But that is quite interesting that it's called a French nut sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, and that gets us back to Turkey. The idea of yes. foods being named as foreign, foreign and with a whole range of different words used mm -hmm. by different people in different times, all of which just really boil down to not from around here. Not from around here. <laughs> yeah. Now, that word, the loaf word, as in to loaf about or to leap, the leaping word for the leaping lord. Yes. There's another related word to that, lapwing, the lap part of lapwing, that right. type of bird. Right. Literally, lapwing means, uh, the wing part doesn't mean wing, surprisingly, even though it refers to a bird. Mm -hmm. uh, wing means wink. Really? So, yeah, lapwink is literally what it means. Hmm. But what is intriguing about this is that the Latin word perdix in one dictionary I found, one Latin dictionary, yeah. glosses perdix as... Oh yes, we had this, I remember mm -hmm. this now. <laughs> as obviously partridge, mm -hmm. as, but also lapwing. Right, as the bird lapwing. Lapwing. And these two birds are, as far as I know, quite unrelated. Yeah, the lapwing's a seabird, a shorebird, mm -hmm. right? We went through this <laughs> I remember this and now we last year. We couldn't really find a, a, a real solution to this. So if there are any mm -hmm. bird experts, particularly experts in Latin bird terminology. <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, when you look at these things up in dictionaries, the dictionaries are not ornithological tables. No. And they often will give you a word, oh, it means this or it means that. It's the same with plant word names mm -hmm. and flower names. And, you know, they aren't giving you a genus and a Latin name and what the common name is in different places may differ and anyway it may just be wrong it may just be wrong and yeah. and so these are I, mean, I did try quite hard last year as i yeah. recall to try to track down if anybody had done any work on exactly what that was mm -hmm. but no i mean the only sort of similarity that i can see there is that they're both ground nesters right but then i mean there are lots so of are lots birds. of birds yes. yeah. yeah yeah but there is that at least point of similarity i can imagine that maybe what that comes from is the story about paradox uh, which i will read in fact it's very close to what you said in the video but mm -hmm. i can read the ovid passage just for edification maybe does make the idea that it's a shorebird make more sense okay so let me read that passage for you so this is from ovid's metamorphoses book eight line 236 to 259 and Daedalus has just flown out of Crete, and he arrived there without his son, who, of course, Icarus, who died on the way, and so he's just buried Icarus. As he was consigning his unfortunate son to the grave, a noisy partridge poked its head out from a muddy ditch, and called, cackling joyfully with whirring wings. It was the only one of its kind, not seen in previous years, and only recently made a bird as a lasting reproach to you, Daedalus. Your sister, Perdix, oblivious to the fates, sent you her son, Talus, to be taught, twelve years old, his mind ready for knowledge. Indeed, the child, studying the spine of a fish, took it as a model, and cut continuous teeth out of sharp metal, inventing the use of the saw. He was also the first to pivot two iron arms on a pin, so that, with the arms at a set distance, one part could be fixed and the other sweep out a circle. Daedalus was jealous, and hurled the boy headlong from Minerva's sacred citadel, claiming that he had fallen. But Pallas Minerva, who favours those with quick minds, caught him, and turned him into the partridge, masking him with feathers in mid-air. His inborn energy was transferred to swift wings and feet, and he cupped his mother's name, Perdix, from before. But the bird does not perch above the ground, and does not make its nest on branches or on high points, but flies low on whirring wings over the soil and lays its eggs in a sheltered place. I take it back, actually. I was remembering it as he threw him off a cliff, 
but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He throws him off a, a temple. A, a tower. So, in like fact, that. it's not a seabird, right. particularly. And the emphasis on the whirring wings right. does definitely suggest that it's the partridge or some bird like that that right. has that sound. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Though I'm pretty sure I saw one version of that story that it was a cliff. Yeah, so maybe I didn't look for other versions. I just mm -hmm. I knew it was in Because now that you mentioned that, I recall reading that somewhere in and some version of that must be why it. it's in yeah. my head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, maybe that's what it is. Maybe one version of the story has him throwing it off a cliff, and so somebody mm. translated it and thought, no, this must be a, a seabird right. then. A seabird, right. But anyway, yeah, if anyone does have any leads on that, I'd be interested in knowing. And, well, coming to the last item on the gift list, the drum, mm -hmm. but obviously the, the slang sense of the word trump. <laughs> yes. Well, let me just read what I wrote in my blog post about this last year. Okay. As for the word Trump related to the drummer's drumming, I'm sure you'll probably be unable not to connect Donald Trump and farting in your mind. But let's all hope that he doesn't triumph, which is the etymology of the other word Trump, as in card games. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the Trump heard round the world, wasn't it? <laughs> the last Trump. The last Trump. Signaling Armageddon, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, and just because I, I like the etymology, I think I mentioned this last year, but I, it's worth mentioning again since we're on bathroom humor. <laughs> um, mistletoe, the etymology of mistletoe oh, yeah. is, of course, poop on a stick. <laughs> yes, you mention that every year. The toe part means twig. The mistle part means literally poop. So poop on a stick. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, he says this every, every year as he hangs the ball of mistletoe up. Uh, and tells the kids that they have to give him kisses if they go underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says it's poop on a stick. It's just all Christmas cheer around here. <laughs> yes, I like ruining Christmas. What can I say? One other little thing, because I don't want to pass up any opportunity for reading more Latin poetry. You mentioned the swan song. Mm. And there's a famous Horace poem. I won't read the whole thing because it's long. But at the end of book two of his odes, at the end of all each of his books of odes, he sort of has a poem that's about him as a poet, mm -hmm. you know, a sort of poem about poetry and about his place as a poet. And he just gets more and more grandiose in each of them. And in the end of book two, he describes himself as turning into a swan. And it's kind of an interesting poem. He says, I'm a poet. I'm not just going to be a weak, low flying poet. I'm going to turn into the best bird of all. And he kind of is metamorphic about it. He says, I'm not going to die. Instead, when I come to die, I'll leave the cities behind. It's not I who will die or be encircled by Stygian waters. Even now the rough skin is settling around my ankles. And now above them, I've become a snow white swan and soft feathers are emerging over my arms and shoulders. And here's a tie into what we just had. Soon, a melodious bird, and more famous than Icarus, Daedalus's son, I'll visit Bosphorus's loud shores, Gaetulian Syrtis, and Hyperborean plains. And he goes on to say, uh, to list a whole bunch of places around mm. the edges of the empire that will know him because he's so famous in this. And then he says, No dirges at my insubstantial funeral, no elegies, and no unseemly grieving. Suppress all the clamor, not for me, the superfluous honor of a tomb. So his claim to poetic immortality is that he will turn, in fact, into the swan, the bird associated with Apollo and poetic, right. with music and poetry. I just thought that was a, a nice tie. And it's, one, it's one of the reasons that the idea of a swan song right. has the idiomatic meaning it does in English is because of that Horace poem, because, of course, Horace is very influential hmm. as a coiner of poetic terms. wonder if that's a trumpeter swan. Shush. <laughs> <laughs> So, as I mentioned, the you know the whole idea of the the song is that it's a sort of game, a forfeit game, and of course, games are appropriate, particularly at this time of year in sort of medieval and early modern tradition. There would be various Christmas games, and this is reflected again in the poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. King Arthur demands a Christmas game, and the Green Knight shows up and gives him one, and he right. describes this exchange of blows as as a game, simply a Christmas game. But of course, it has a sort of potentially deadly outcome. So anyways, Christmas games. Mm -hmm. One of the points there is to connect it to Saturnalia, mm -hmm. which was a, certainly an influence on Christmas and Christmas customs. And Saturnalia was a time of festival and in particular of games. And one specific game related issue is that at Saturnalia, public gambling was allowed. Oh. Now, the caveat is technically under the Republic anyway, gambling in public and possibly gambling at all was illegal at any other time of the year. 
that seems to have had absolutely no effect on whether or not people gambled. <laughs> Gambling was not. highly normal. And specifically dice playing is what seems to be associated with Saturnalia. Hmm. So in spite of the fact that the prohibition never really had effect, Saturnalia was still the time when, you know, you could play dice in the street and at dinner parties without any impropriety. And in fact, it was kind of encouraged. It was the time for doing it. And so it it is strongly associated with that particular kind of, of game playing. And in particular, we know um, about it. One of the reasons is because Augustus was very fond of dice playing. Now, he was fond of dice playing all his life at all times, regardless of it being technically illegal. But he particularly mentions multiple times that any time there was a festival day or a holiday or a day that he could possibly do it, he would play dice and he loved doing it and gambled. And uh, dice are one of the things that survive on almost every archaeological site. There mm -hmm. are dice found because they tend to be made of bone or ivory. They obviously survive. Last, right? And they're very recognizable because mm -hmm. they're marked. They're six-sided dice with six numbers on them, like six dots, you know, the, the dots, the just dots. like ours. Right. The other Christmas game that we play is Snapdragon. Yes. Which is potentially as old as medieval, probably. But certainly, certainly Shakespearean. Yeah, it certainly goes back to Shakespeare, and it seems to be associated with Christmas and sometimes with Halloween, but mm -hmm. mostly with Christmas, and Twelfth Night. Right. It's the game where you take fruit, raisins usually, but it could be other dried fruit, and you pour slightly warmed brandy over it and set it on fire, and then everybody has to reach in and pull the raisins out of the fire, and you know the the prize is the raisins mm -hmm. <laughs> which are very tasty because they're brandy soap <laughs> and if you hold back too long the fire gets warmer and warmer the longer you wait and the more cowardly you are about it the more likely you are to actually hurt your hand so fortune favors the bold indeed and there are various stories about it and its purpose but it perhaps is associated with solstice right with the idea of bringing back the sun and fires uh associated with the turnings of the year and with solstices so that does make sense but it is a christmas game mm -hmm. and we play it every year indeed at the solstice yes at a solstice party that we go to a family and friend solstice party so next i want to turn to the idea of the the song as as a list of gifts mm. and of course i mentioned the christmas price index right <laughs> and so how much was it last year Oh gosh, I don't remember last year. <laughs> okay, remember. yeah, you said it in the let, let me let me get, pull up the yeah. So last year, have, I just looked it up. Last year, you said it was one hundred and fifty five thousand four hundred and seven dollars. Well, it's gone up this year, mm -hmm. unsurprisingly, by point seven percent. Okay. For a total cost of one hundred and fifty six thousand five hundred and seven dollars and eighty eight cents. Okay, so that's one thousand one hundred dollars and seventy cents. <laughs> okay. <laughs> More expensive. I hope you budgeted for that. <laughs> well, of course, my dear. I mean, we always get each other all of the 12 <laughs> days of Christmas presents, don't we? And so as they explain on the website, the cost of this year's CPI rose ever so slightly, driven by the price increases for the turtle doves due to lack of availability and wage increases for the drummers and pipers. <laughs> wage now increases? You know. <laughs> Who's getting wage, wage increases? Increase. Well, apparently drummers and pipers are. Only those, though. Yes, not not the maids of milking. <laughs> oh, goodness, presumably. no. Nobody pays them more. No. But drummers and pipers are like, you know, rock stars or something. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> so I wanted to also, in the interest of gift lists, yes, <laughs> make a few recommendations about Christmas presents you might want to buy your friends and family. Uh, if you have any friends who are also lovers of language and history and culture and connected things. I have a couple of recent books that have come out that I can recommend. One, of course, is the book that I mentioned by Mark Forsyth, The Christmas Cornucopia, it's called. Right. I'm making a note of all of these so that I can put them on our website. We'll put a link to it, yes. And in fact, I, I use it as, as one of the important sources for this new Christmas video that's coming out this year. So you can stay tuned for that. The other book that I would recommend is the new book from Paul Anthony Jones, who is the the brilliant mind behind Haggard Hawks, the Haggard Hawks YouTube channel and Haggard Hawks uh, Twitter stream. Who, uh, of course, we interviewed a few interviewed. episodes back. Yep. Yep. So his new book has, has come out nicely in time for Christmas. Uh, in the UK. In the UK, yes. It's not yet available in North America. So sorry, North Americans. But for those of you in the UK, I think it would make a great Christmas present. Mm -hmm. the, it's called The Accidental Dictionary. Mm-hmm. 
And I suppose if you're really nice and live in the UK, you could buy it and send it to somebody in North America. There you go. <laughs> Cost you three times as much to ship it as it would to buy it, but you know. <laughs> Do you have any Christmas gift recommendations? <laughs> Well, only a self-serving one. <laughs> if you would like, we have made a card, a Christmas card, based on the 12 days of Christmas, with the image that was our source for each of the images for the gifts mm -hmm. in the video. All 12 of those, that's on the front of the card. And the etymological line, on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a fart bird in a pear tree. And then inside is a brief explanation of, the of etymology. that etymology mm -hmm. and where Partridge comes from. So if that amuses you and you, more importantly, have friends and family that you might be <laughs> amused rather than offended by such a card, <laughs> they're available on our website, cafepress.ca slash endless not, linked, of course, from our website. And those are available to order if you want. And there's some other merchandise there if you do think that there's anybody mm -hmm. who would be interested. We do not yet have Christmas ornaments up, though Mark is urging me to find time to put up a... A fart bird Christmas ornament. <laughs> Christmas tree ornament. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. And of course, as I mentioned before, the, the James Burke Connections app Kickstarter, they have a Christmas gift option so you can send that as a christmas gift to support for the for the app as a christmas gift to someone right so if you have any james burke fans in your friends or family that you would like to uh send that to you could consider that as well oh and i think doesn't link space have some link space has a whole uh several item, christmas uh, items, items and, and they're like syn yeah. uh, it's a syntax tree a syntax christmas tree yeah, yeah and that like a t-shirt or a sweatshirt with it's, that. A, it's a cushion i think I think that maybe maybe had on things. several yeah. items, yeah. Yeah, so there's um, LingSpace is a video channel, YouTube mm -hmm. channel that does linguistics videos and and takes you through history of linguistics and important linguistic concepts, and it's very good. And they have a n number of items in their merch store that I think could definitely be of interest. Yes, to yeah. So yeah. Yeah, if you have any linguistics fans in your circle, I definitely recommend go and browse too. their store. So that leaves only one thing left <laughs> the song so maybe you should just mention what you did well since i'd gone to all the trouble of tracking down the etymologies of all the items in the 12 days of christmas uh, i decided to rewrite the song in the spirit of of making it more difficult to sing <laughs> Because that's the problem. We know the words to the song so well now that it's no, it no longer works as a sort of forfeit game. To explain a forfeit game, because not everyone will know what you're talking about when you talk about that. Okay, th so the idea is each person in a circle, so that you go around in a circle and each person has to add one item to the list. And, and then and remember the whole list. So the they have to list. recite the whole list and then add, add one more. One, yeah. And the next person, and the first person to mess up pays a forfeit. Pays some sort um, of forfeit, yeah. You know, money or uh, does a trick or drinks a shot or yeah, however whatever you want it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in the, with the song, it's, you do the same thing, but you sing it. Mm -hmm. So if you mess up and you say six lords are leaping when it's not, mm -hmm. then yeah. you're the one who got it wrong. But of course, people know the song so well now that it's not all that challenging as a forfeit <laughs> game. So in, in the interest of making it more difficult, I rewrote the song, making all the items their sort of etymological equivalents. <laughs> not only is it harder to sing because it one doesn't remember it anymore, they're also much harder much to harder, fit into yes. the scansion of yeah. the verse. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as musical as, as the original <laughs> version of the song. And I say that as someone who had to learn it because Mark and I recorded a version of it with the new words which is not maybe the world's most professional <laughs> recording, but we did our best. But boy, oh boy, were there some lines that were hard to get in. <laughs> so we will play our, our rendition of this uh, to... To play us out. Play us out. But if you're interested in trying it yourself, we have also put online uh, a just the backing track of the song without the words mm -hmm. and uh, a downloadable lyric sheet. Mm -hmm. All of those are available at the website so that you can karaoke it up. Yes. <laughs> so give it a try and let us know if you do any better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> try to make the rest of your friends and family sing it. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. And it will in no way ruin Christmas for everyone. <laughs> so on that note, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. If you're not celebrating Christmas, be glad that there's no fart birds in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back with a new episode after the holidays. Indeed.
On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a far bird in a pear tree. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two cooing smoke buffs and a far bird in a pear tree. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke puffs, and a far bird in a pear tree. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me four bright red glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke puffs, and a far bird in a pear tree. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Five gleaming bands, four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke pots, and a fart bird in a pear tree. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six waterfowl, accounting five gleaming bands, four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke pots, and a fart bird in a pear tree. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Seven songbirds in a sound, six waterfowl, accounting five gleaming bands Four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke puffs, and a fart bird in a pear tree On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Eight stroking virgins, seven sound birds in a sound, six waterfowl, accounting five gleaming bands. Four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing hawks, two cooing smoke pops, and a far bird in a pear tree. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me nine loaf makers, trembling, eight stroking virgins, seven sound birds in a sound, six waterfowl, accounting five gleaming Four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke pops, and a far bird in a pear tree. On the tenth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me ten loaf guards loafing, nine loaf makers trembling, eight stroking virgins, seven sound birds in a sound, six waterfowl, a counting five gleaming bands. Four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke pops, and a far Eleventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Eleven pigeons chirping, ten loaf cards loafing Nine loaf makers trembling, eight stroking virgins Seven sound birds in a sound, six waterfowl accounting Five gleaming bands Four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks Two cooing smoke pops and a fart bird in a pear tree On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Twelve loud slayers hitting, eleven pigeons chirping, ten loaf guards loafing, nine loaf makers trembling, eight stroking virgins, seven sound birds in a sound, six waterfowl accounting, five gleaming bands. Four bright glowing chicks, three frankly singing cocks, two cooing smoke pops, and a far bird in a pear tree. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.